witness. Your Honor, the House calls Greg Cox. Bailiff will bring in Greg Cox. And Mr. President, if I may, in an attempt to hopefully expedite the process, I have um, an, one piece of evidence that I intend to show while Mr. Cox is on the stand. It is exhibit number 249, whose affidavit attached is number 640. It's a video before the Senate Finance Committee from February 10th, 2021. It is a government record, uh, and it is authenticated by the uh, proper um, affidavit associated with it. We'd offer the same in evidence. You're going to submit that, right? I'm offering it as evidence, Your Honor, because I intend to play it with the witness. Do you I have to any expedite, objections? I was hoping to get any objections uh, taken care of beforehand. Do you have any objections? No, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Cox, raise your right hand. I do solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence I give upon this hearing by the Senate of Texas impeachment charges against Warren Kenneth Paxton Jr. shall be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God. Please take your seat. Court will admit into evidence Exhibit 249 and Exhibit 640. Thank you, Mr. President. May I proceed? Good afternoon, sir. Good, good afternoon. I'm going to need you to uh, speak a little bit closer to the mic. I'm never really told that nobody can hear me, but uh, I know that acoustics are not great, so please step forward and, or slide forward to make sure we can hear you. Very good. Would you please introduce yourself uh, to the honorable senators? Uh, my name is Greg Cox. And tell us, sir, how you're currently employed. I am currently the first assistant with the Hayes County District Attorney's Office in San Marcos. Could you give us, please, a, a quick briefing of your history, uh, professional and perhaps even law school that led you up to this point? Yes, um, I attended law school at the University of Texas and um, actually during my first year of law school I worked here at the Texas Senate. Uh, took a year off from law school, worked for an accounting firm and then uh, when I went back during my second year I got a, law, a job as a law clerk at the Travis County District Attorney's Office in the Public Integrity Unit. Um, upon graduation and passing the bar, I was offered a position as an assistant district attorney and I ended up staying with the Travis County District Attorney's Office for 30 full years. After leaving the District Attorney's Office in those 30 years of service, uh, did you go to another government or quasi-government job? I did. I initially went uh, and was general counsel in 2021 at the Texas Civil Commitment Office, a small state agency that oversees uh, people that have been civilly committed as sexually violent predators. I left there and went to the Texas District and County Attorneys Association where I was assistant director of training. And then in January of this year, I became first assistant in the Hayes County office. I appreciate that, sir. Thank you. Um, during your time at the Travis County District Attorney's Office, you indicated you were Director of Special Prosecutions Division. Did that include investigations into public corruption? Yes, it did. I served as Director of Special Prosecutions, which included the state-funded Public Integrity Unit while it existed um, for 15 years, the end of 2021 to the end of 2016. I figure you might get some questions about that, but I'll let my colleagues take care of that. Let's move on then to your time at the district attorney's office towards the end. Um, who was the district attorney, not the last elected district attorney that you served under, uh, but second to last, if I'm asking that right? So... Let me ask it a better way. Do you know Margaret Moore? Yes. Okay. So 2017 through 2020, Margaret Moore was district attorney. During her administration, I was uh, serving as director of operations. Very good. Did she ask you at some point um, to speak with her, uh, or let me ask you this, uh, did you flag a concern for her related to uh, a possible open records request? In October of 2020, um, one of my responsibilities was overseeing public information. Um, I became aware of an open records request that the office had received related to Ken Paxton and Nate Paul. Um, I didn't know what was going on. I asked a question about that. She briefed me on some things that had been going on that I had been unaware of, 
and uh, then asked me to start joining into some meetings uh, with some individuals related to that. Is it fair to say that up until that point you had not heard the name Nate Paul in relation to the Travis County District Attorney's Office? That's correct. Very good. Then who did you speak with uh, at Ms. Moore's request? Initially, I spoke with a couple of lawyers that represented the Mitty Foundation. And let me back up. I, I poorly phrased that question as I often do. Uh, back that up to say, Ms. Moore, you indicated wanted to speak with you yes. about this request. Did you speak with Ms. Moore and was there anybody else present? I spoke with Ms. Moore and Don Klimmer. I may have spoken with Mindy Montford, although I can't recall that for certain. And based on what you learned uh, during that conversation, was there a next step that you took? Um, I drafted up a, a real brief overview of potential criminal offenses that could be relevant to the situation that they briefed me on. Um, and then we set up a series of meetings uh, to gather more information. Do you recall, recall approximately when it was that you drafted this initial, well, I'm gonna call it a skeleton outline? If I am recalling the dates correctly, the initial conversation was on October 21st of 2020. I drafted the first memo on October 23rd, which was Friday of that week. And then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of the following week, we had a series of meetings. And then I believe it was on October 28th that I drafted a more thorough uh, memo about the situation. Your Honor, if I may approach the witness uh, after I ask the following question, I'm going to show you what I don't intend to introduce into evidence, but uh, would ask if you would uh, rely on your memo to refresh your memory. Sure. Objection, Your Honor. He hasn't said that he doesn't remember anything yet. He Fair enough, Mr. He can't sit up there and, and, and testify from a document that's clearly hearsay. Your Honor, I'll rephrase. I apologize. Thank you. And Mr. President, I, I keep saying Your Honor, force yeah. of habit. What, whatever's comfortable for you. Thank you, sir. Do you have a full recollection of each and every item that you outlined in your October 28th, 2020 memo? I have a reasonably good recollection of it. Do you feel that looking at that would assist and aid you in your testimony in order to provide comment to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury and not waste a lot of time? I do. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Your Honor, may I, again, and again, I'm all about saving some time, but this is not proper to give him a document that he hasn't said, he didn't ask a specific question about, do you remember this, remember that? You don't just refresh your recollection with a, a entire document. It's not how it works. Your Honor, respectfully, I have yet to hear a single objection on this issue from Mr. Busby other than his complaints about it. I will proffer to the court, if I may, sir. It's hearsay. This, You're if not I allowed. May, sir, if I may, sir, I thank you. I've allowed you to continue your objections, and I ask you to give me the same decency. Your Honor, this witness is testifying that he created a report. He has testified here today that he doesn't have full memory of everything contained in that report. And Mr. President, he has said that it would assist him in providing testimony to the jury. O overrule the objection. Thank you. May I approach Mr. President? Yes, you may. I hope I'm not the only one that's ever happened to because my wife will take care of me later on. Sir, tell me after your initial meeting with uh, Margaret Moore and Mr. Clemmer, what steps did you take, if any? So the initial conversation, um, I was provided a briefing of some facts that they knew at that point. Um, I then went and looked at some basic op open source information to gather some additional facts, and I drafted an earlier version of this memo that did not include any fact summary. It only included an outline of potential criminal offenses that might be avenues of investigation. Um, I provided that to Ms. Moore on Friday the 23rd, and then we had the series of meetings that I referenced a moment ago and I drafted this memo after that series of meetings. Do you recall the individuals who you spoke with? And I'm not asking you what they said, just the identity of those individuals. Yes, as I started mentioning a little bit ago, uh, two attorneys from the MIT, MIT, MIT Foundation, however you say that. Um, then we had a meeting that Monday afternoon, a video meeting over Zoom with uh, Mr. Mateer. The following day, we had a telephone conference call with uh, Mr. Maxwell. And then the next day, Wednesday of that week, we had a 
rather lengthy conference call with Mr. Penley. And then did you summarize, did you summarize those facts as you knew them within this report that I provided to you, which you had drafted around October 28th? Yes, I took detailed notes and then I wrote this fact summary and the, the rest of the memo after that. Very good. And again, I'm not going to go into you about the specifics in your report. Uh, you're here to testify about your memory. So let me ask you, as a result of your conversations, let me back that up. Would you call what you did an investigation? I would call it a preliminary investigation. Would it be fair to describe it as a limited investigation? Yes. So in this preliminary limited investigation, you spoke with uh, multiple individuals. And were you able to identify in your mind possible criminal offenses? Yes, I was. And who would have been the subject of the possible criminal offenses? Primarily Ken Paxton, but there were other individuals uh, that were also identified as potential suspects. Very good. <clears throat> I'd like to ask you um, which offenses you identified, and I'm going to ask you one by one to just go slowly. Could you tell me, please, what you believe the first potential offense you identified was? Potentially bribery. Bribery. What else did you identify? Accepting a gift to a public servant. Very good. Next. Um, official abuse of official capacity under 3902 of the penal code, okay. which uh, has two different ways of committing the offense. One is misusing something of value belonging to government for an improper purpose. Second part is violating a law relating to your office or employment, and I believed that there were commission, uh, there were potential offenses under both of those sections. Ms. Benella, could I please ask you to bring up on the screen the two, uh, the three potential criminal offenses that have been identified? Objection, Your Honor. We all know that Ken Pax has not been charged with anything. This is completely improper. He possible, possible criminal violations. This is completely improper. Your Honor, this information goes directly to rebut inferences provided by the defense team concerning any possible investigation that may have occurred. Additionally, it goes specifically to articles of impeachment regarding potential abuse of power, potential bribery. Uh, many of the other ones we're about to elicit from this witness, Your Honor. May I be heard one, one further time, Your Honor? Imagine that it would be proper in a court for somebody to come here and say, he's possibly did this, possibly did that, possibly did this. Incredibly improper. That's pure speculation. He and hasn't been charged with anything. And even if he were charged, he'd still be innocent. Your Honor. So this is completely improper. And Mr. I object to it because it's speculation. Mr. Busby, I apologize for interrupting. If I may, Your Honor, just briefly, this witness is here to testify to his perceptions, his opinions. They are opinions that can be challenged. He is a lay witness under Rule 701. And he is using his information and rationally based on his perception is providing opinions which would be helpful to the jury to understand a fact and issue. He is available to be cross-examined by Mr. Busby, who I'm sure will take him on cross-examination and test his credibility. He hasn't responded to the objection, which is this is all speculation. I mean, he could say that about everybody here. Possible this, possible that. That's why as the gatekeeper, the court can't allow it. And, Your Honor, again, I've responded directly to it as a Rule 701 okay, lay hold, test. Just hold it. I apologize. I got it. Overrule the objection. Go ahead. Thank you. Ms. Manella, if you would, please. Sir, as I bring up on the screen, I just want to make sure these are three that you have identified here in court. Is this an accurate and correct summary of the testimony you've provided up to this point? It is. Please, sir, the next potential offense that you've identified. Um, we were also concerned about some election code violations. Um, if certain factors came into play about how money may have been transmitted or handed over, um, and along those same lines, money laundering under 3402 of the penal code. 
Money laundering is listed now on here. Is that accurate and uh, an accurate summary of what you've stated? That is. Very good. What is the next offense that you identified? Uh, tampering with a governmental record and possible perjury related to personal financial statements filed under Chapter 572 of the Government Code. And Mr. Cox, I'll ask you as you turn to the side, just make sure to keep your voice up so we can all hear you. Yes. Please, sir, what's the next one you identified as a potential offense? Uh, coercion of a public servant under 3602 of the Penal Code. And again, what's shown up on the screen, does that accurately reflect the testimony you provided? It is. Next offense? Uh, official oppression under 3903 of the Penal Code and retaliation under 3606 of the Penal Code. Again, those two that have just popped up on the screen, do those accurately reflect your testimony? Yes. Next offense that you potentially identified. We discussed um, whether there could be under Penal Code 1502 of the Penal Code or under Penal Code Section 7102, um, either a criminal conspiracy to commit any of these offenses, including the ones that haven't been put on the screen that I mentioned, um, or engaging in organized criminal activity with connection to these offenses. Was there also, was there also an identification of a potential government code section violation? Yes, uh, Chapter 572 of the Government Code not only has the financial disclosure rules, it also has standards of conduct for state employees in subchapter C, and there was uh, what appeared to be a fairly clear violation of one of the provisions of that section. Sir, the information that's displayed on the screen now, is this an accurate summary of, the, uh, of your testimony here today, specifically as to the potential offenses that you personally identified? Yes, it is. Your Honor, I've marked for uh, identification purposes exhibit number 660, which is the entirety of what is shown on the screen, and I would offer the same in evidence as a summation. It is submitted into evidence. Thank you, Your Honor. Did you object? I, I, I was going to, I, Your Honor. I'm but sorry. We, I, excuse me. Why don't we? Me, I thought you had already allowed it earlier and had not been admitted. So state your objection. Uh, uh, why don't uh, we write on there that accurately reflect the testimony of potential or possible instead of just putting the statutes on there? He, the witness clearly said that he speculated this might have been some offenses. And so it would be really improper to put that into evidence without clearly identifying that these are all potentials or possibles that have never been indicted on, ever. May I respond, Your Honor, or Mr. President? May I respond? I know Mr. President has indicated um, his uh, desire not to have to look at too many numbers, so I'm probably going to make it worse by suggesting the following, but the Texas Supreme Court under Uniroyal Goodrich Tire v. Martinez and Inspire v. Webster College have adopted the charts that summarize or perhaps emphasize testimony are admissible if the underlying information has been admitted into evidence. This is simply a summary. Mr. Busby may question the witness at his leisure concerning the qualifications and any particular changes that he believes are appropriate for this jury to understand. But, Your Honor, it has to be a fair summary. I, no one's challenging that you can do a summary, but it has to be a fair summary, and that's not fair. I'm going to sustain the objection. You were allowed to bring it in. He said these were possible, um, so I'm going to sustain the objection. And so can we have it, if it's going to come into evidence, right, possible on it or potential? That's yes. How, yes, thank you. Do you agree? I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to identify it as, as the testimony which has been provided as possible evidence, and I'll even identify that it's by Mr. Greg Cox. And then are you if he write, If he it? writes that on there, because that's going to be on the front page of the newspaper, and let's make it clear that this guy didn't have any evidence of that. Your Honor, may I do that at a break so as not to take any further time, but before formally submitted in evidence? Yes, on each one, each item. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Mr. President, excuse me, either. Thank you. Sir, after you've identified these uh, possible potential offenses, and again, this is your opinion, and as you've described to us, you have worked in the criminal field for some 30 years. Is that accurate? Correct. <clears throat> what, if anything, did you do? After discussing this with Margaret Moore, um, the decision was made to reach out to the U.S. Attorney's Office, make sure that moving forward with an investigation would not interfere with any ongoing federal investigation, and I was tasked with making those calls and setting up meetings about that. The Chapter 572 of the Government Code offense that you flagged, was that one that you discussed with Margaret Moore? I believe so, yes. Do you recall um, the complete language of Section 572 of the Government Code? 
Not off the top of my head. Could you recite it off the top of your head? I could not. If you had a copy of the statute, would it assist you in providing your testimony here today? Yes, it would. Your Honor, for identification purposes only and not for admission, I'd offer um, 661 of the House Board of Managers uh, exhibit to the witness and to counsel so they may review as the witness testifies. Are you bringing it forward? Yes, Your Honor, but again, not offered to, as not offered in evidence, but merely for uh, purposes of, of reliance during his testimony. Okay. May I have a copy? Yes. Sir, could you identify for us, and, and you don't have to read directly from it, but uh, are you familiar uh, after having looked at this document with 572.002. Yes, I am. And does it provide, uh, tell us what your thought process was, and if you need to re refer to the document, please do, but what your thought process was as to why this would be a potential violation. Well, actually 572.002 sets out who the various officers are that are subject to this. 572.051 sets out the standards of conduct. And what I referenced earlier in my testimony about the violating a law related to his office or employment under 3902 of the Penal Code, this would constitute a law relating to someone's office or employment. Um, and the subsection A, uh, says that a state officer should not accept or solicit any gift, favor, or service that might reasonably tend to influence the officer or employee in the discharge of his official duties or that the officer or employee knows uh, or should know is being offered with the intent to influence the officer or employee's official conduct. So after flagging these potential violations for your elected district attorney Moore, what actions did you take? I reached out to the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, spoke with the uh, then uh, manager of the Austin branch of the U.S. Attorney's Office, Ashley Hoff, and uh, we ended up setting up a meeting. Was the idea to reach out to the local United States Attorney's Office yours or Ms. Moore's? I believe it was mine, um, although I can't say that Ms. Moore didn't also suggest it. Was there any concern, well, let me, ask, let me ask it a different way. Was there any concern about um, an ongoing investigation? So much of what we were talking about related to Nate Paul, and we knew that Nate Paul was the subject of a federal investigation, we were concerned that if we jumped into this and opened an investigation, we were going to interfere with an ongoing federal investigation. So we just wanted to basically deconflict with the feds before we took any action. Is that common, that deconfliction, is that common? That is common. Don't want to run into each other on the investigation? Correct. Want to make sure the witnesses know that there are potentially two tracks going? Exactly. Fair enough. <clears throat> Do you recall who all you, well, let me ask you this. You set up a meeting, correct? Set up a couple of different meetings. Initially, we had a conference call, uh, Margaret Moore, Don Clemmer, and myself from the district attorney's office. Uh, Greg Sofer, Ashley Hoff, and Christina Platon from the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, and we talked through a lot of the facts, um, and then we agreed to have an in-person meeting the following week. In between those two meetings, I was advised that um, because Mr. Clemmer and Ms. Objection. Moore... Objection. Hearsay. Sustained. Can you tell us um, whether or not there were multiple people from your office who, would go, who were supposed to be meeting uh, with the U.S. Attorney's Office? When we set up the in-person meeting, I was the only person attended so that no potential witnesses were involved. And did those potential witnesses include individuals from your office? Correct. Fair enough. Without getting into the content of what was discussed at that meeting, did you believe you had a path forward to continue your investigation? That's what we were trying to determine, was whether there was a path forward that did not interfere with a significant federal investigation that was going on. Did you believe that you, after that meeting, had a path forward? After that meeting, I was still unclear. Um, the the in-person meeting we had included people from Washington, D.C. that came down for the meeting. Um, 
And then shortly after that meeting, I had a telephone call with someone from the U.S. Attorney's Office, and at that point, we stood down. You stood down. Was that your desire to stand down? I was frustrated by that. Is it fair to say that you had additional investigation that you wanted to achieve? Yes. And I should phrase that differently. Was it something that you wanted to achieve or you felt the evidence would lead you to follow? It was something I felt worth, was worthy of investigation. It involved important issues involving the state of Texas, and I was concerned that, as I had seen happen too often, the federal government would sit on it for a long time, and then we might not see anything happen. Does that appear to have been the case thus far? It does. Finally, sir, uh, as you were going through Section 572.051, I'd ask you to take a look at subsection D of that statute. Yes. As it relates to the testimony that you previously provided that an officer, an employee, a state officer, or employee should not solicit gifts, favors, services, or bribes, does it indicate who is responsible for drafting the policies that would go throughout the entire state? Subsection C of that statute says that each state agency shall adopt a policy and it places the burden of drafting a model policy of these standards of conduct and making sure that ethical policies on, are in place on the Attorney General. I'll pass the witness, Your Honor. Mr. Busby, we were going to break in five minutes. We can go 10 or 15 if you want to start and then we'll break, or, or do you want to break, break now? Okay. Members will break now. This is your uh, late afternoon uh, break. We'll come back at 5.15, and then we'll go to about 7.